Uh, so I'm very happy to open uh, the third session on the conference on anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism, and delegitimizing Israel. Um, I'm opening up with the first speaker, that is uh, Anat Varon, that she's currently writing her PhD dissertation on Franz Werfel and the search for identity in the first Austrian Republic under the supervision of Professor Robert Listrich. She received her MA the uh, dissertation with Laude from the Department of History at the Hebrew University in 2007. The subject of her thesis was entitled Ure de Stimme, the Austrian Jewish identity of Stefan Zweig and Franz Werfel as reflected in the works on Yermiau. <laughs> she will be speaking on Franz Werfel and the Jews as a chosen people. I just want to remind two things. The speaker to speak no more than 25 minutes. And uh, uh, the streets were closed. A gentleman just announced it from 6.15 to 7.15. Please. The streets, the streets in Jerusalem, <laughs> all over the place, it was crazy. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, let me say that I'm very, very glad to be here. As you already heard, what well, work is my uh, PhD? Okay. 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 Uh, Robert is my uh, PhD advisor, and I'd like to say a few words before I will begin, because um, this lecture, this presentation, is based on a paper I wrote many years ago in uh, one of Robert's seminars about the... Um, Telephone? Okay. okay. Yes, a paper I wrote uh, many years ago in a Robert seminar about the marginal Jews, and I thought it would be a nice uh, closure since I'm about to finish my PhD, so to use this opportunity and to present something about um, Franz Werfel. And um, I just wanted to say that I also want to use this opportunity to actually thank Robert for the many years that he has been my uh, advisor, also during my MA. And I, I can only testify. Okay, and as I said, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Robert for all of his support during the many years we know each other, during my MA, during my PhD, and I can only testify as a student uh, that he's really not only a world first class scholar, but also a great human being. He's always very generous with his time we usually have very long talks together, and I appreciate it very much. So I also say thank you, Robert. And now to my lecture. Um, if we can go to the next slideshow. Uh, I will talk about Franz Werfel and his relation to the Jews as a collective group. Why is this a question? Because Franz Werfel, who was born in the pre-First World War Prague, uh, had for many years a problem with the idea that he was a Jew. Um, for those of you who don't know, Franz Werfel was one of the most uh, important and successful others in interwar Vienna, but he is mostly famous for one work, if we can move to the next slide, the next one, which is the um, 40 Days of uh, Musa Gag. 
which he wrote in 1933, and it is about the Armenian uh, genocide during the First World War. And the quotation I brought here, I will not read it, you can read it, but it also shows the problem of being a part of a community. Here it portrays in the Armenian problem, but of course there is a close relation between the story of the Armenian in 1933 and in Velfen being a Jew writing about his story, uh, which I will uh, explain later on. Um, if we can go back to the first slide, I just want to say that um, when the Anschluss came, Velfen left Austria. He was married to Alma Mahler, the widow of uh, Gustav Mahler, who was a Catholic woman, and but she flew with him to America, and there uh, uh, he arrived there in 1940. And until 1945, he died in 1945, he became one of the most successful uh, German exiles in America. And this is also an unbelievable story. The last chapter in Welfel's career in America is almost unparalleled to what, uh, how much successful he was uh, in Europe. And if we can go uh, two slides up. Thank you. Uh, before I will talk about Welfen's conception of the Jews as chosen uh, people, I want to explain that to me this is his solution. So in order to understand the solution, we need to understand the problem. Welfen was born, as I already said, in Fangesiekel, Prague. He will belong to the same generation, more or less, of Franz Kafka, Max Brod, all of these people that we know, that we also know the close connection between their work and the city of Prague. Franz Welfen started as an expressionist uh, poet, because Prague was really the city where the German expressionism was the most uh, dominant and also most connected to the feeling of the end of the world. And this was connected to the national clash between Germans and Jews, and especially for the Jewish intellectuals who were belong to the German-speaking minority, it was like a triple problem of religion, of not being connected to the religion of their fathers on the one side, on the other side, not really belonging to the Czech majority, and not being accepted to the German minority because of uh, racial anti-Semitism, which was repeatedly uh, growing in Prague. So this is something that is very important to understand about Werfen. In his uh, first uh, poetry book, which he published in 1911, entitled The Weltfreund, and the title by, in, by itself can tell you its message, humanistic message, he talks about brotherly love and embracing all fellow men. And, uh, but pretty soon after this book, the message shifted a little bit from impressing all men to searching God. And in the other books, he really talks a lot about the problem of the mankind, the problem of uh, human guilt. God created the world, and with that, the human being is guilty of this burden, and so on. And this is also connected to his essence as a Jew. What is interesting is that it took Welfen many years to realize that his feeling of estrangement and alienation that he always connected to Prague, which he left already in 1912, because he felt that as a German poet, he has nothing to look in the city, that to him was like a paralyzing ghetto. This is how we called it, a city who offered no reality, kind of Yerkish kind for uh, a non-Czech person. This is Welfen Ward in 1912, and he decided to leave. After the war, he lived to Germany, and after the war, he lived permanently in Vienna, where he meets Alma Manuel Welfen, and this is also probably a reason why he stayed there. Um, Moving on, after we understand some of the problem, I want to jump to the period of the First World War. Can you move a slide? Oh no, go one back, it's too soon. Um, during the war, Welfen served uh, one year in East Galicia. 
uh, but only one year, and then he was transferred to Vienna, and this is also how we met Alma Mala, and he stayed here. And uh, during that time, in 1916, he decided that in order to resolve all the conflict he was feeling, he would declare himself a Jew who believes in Christ. Okay, what is the relation to Christianity? Again, Prague, Wilson, um, was raised to a highly assimilated Jewish family. And Welfen family was very rich, probably the most richest among all the other uh, assimilated families. He was raised by a Catholic nanny named Barbara Simeonkova, who came from the Czech provinces. And she used to take him with her to church every Sunday, ever since he was four years old. And this trip to the church, with his great affection of Barbara, whom he used to call Bobby, and he also used to write about her in many of his work. She always symbolized to him piety and love and warmth. So he connected all of this to the church, to Christianity, to Barbara. So this was this part of his identity. Relatively in a young age, he felt more comfortable with, instead of with Judaism, and I will give you only one example, he said that his father used to take him to the Meisel Zeinagog, we can see it here in the picture. This is also where he celebrated his bar mitzvah. But he said, my only impression from this synagogue are of timidity on the one side and repugnance on the other side. He didn't like it. It made him feel ashamed, unsecure. He did not understand all the mystic atmosphere in the synagogue, as contrary to the church, where he was just sitting with Barbara, getting all the love and praying. So this was his uh, relation to Christianity. At that time, Welfen friend from Prague, the Zionist thinker Max Bott, was shocked by Welfen's admission that he's calling himself a Jew who believes in Christ. And this is interesting that Max Bott was shocked because he knew Welfen for many years and they had many arguments and even caused their some break in their relationship. And also, a few months before Welfen declared that he is a Jew who believes in Christ, Max Roth published an article entitled Unsere Literaten und die Gemeinschaft, our literates, our writers, and the community. And there it talks about a uh, movement that is spreading among the young uh, Jewish intellectuals where they are more attracted to what he called new Christianity. And what is the problem with this uh, movement? Not only that he is drifting away from Judaism, it rejects him being belonging to the Jewish community, to any type of Jewish gemeinschaft, and he sees in Welfen as the representative and actually the victim of this uh, movement. But he was surprised, and, uh, and then also Martin Buber comes into the picture. Martin Buber actually was less shocked by Welfen, he was more uh, sympathetic to him, and Welfen reassures him, and I will just read one line from a letter already after the admission in Christianity. He writes to Buber, I feel myself, nationally speaking, entirely a Jew, with all the bad connotations to the term and some of the good ones. And often say, okay, I understand you need time, and he even tells Mark Walt, leave him alone, don't push him, he will come together. And Martin Hoover tells Werfel, I ask only one thing of you. Publish an article in my journal, the Jude, and talk about your acknowledgement of Judaism. Then everybody will be reassured. And Werfel says, okay, no problem, and this is 1917. It took him some years, and only in 1920s, he thinks about, okay, maybe I should do it, and he starts to write this article, also has a very dramatic title in German, Ergus und Beichte. I mean, it's a confession and a fusion. It's also show about the burst of emotion, now I need to deal with Judaism. And this article remains unpublished, part of the reason Welfare well, never finished it, of course, but also because it is so 
feel we, anti-Semitic stereotypes and criticism about Zionism and the Old Union and Orthodox Jews and assimilated Jews that it just could not be published. But one thing I want to quote from this uh, article, and this is the entire uh, alienation of Werfel from any kind of Jewish Gemeinschaft. In this article, in 1920, he writes, I live and strive in a world whose cultural blooming I passionately love. To its greatness, I want to contribute. It is the object of all my affection, my hope, my criticism and fulfillment. And one day, I must realize that I do not belong to it. I belong elsewhere. There, it doesn't want to belong, and this is the main uh, problem. But now at least he recognizes that there is also a problem with his uh, non-Jewish world, and he needs to think about it. Next slide, please. Vettel was married to Alma Manuel, and Alma Manuel was a woman that uh, when she wanted something, she usually got it, and she decided she wanted to go to the Near East. Palestine and Egypt, and this initiative came from her. And they took their first trip to Palestine in 1925. The second trip will, also, will already be Welfen initiative. Alma will want to go to India. And in this on board of the ship to Vienna, the trip to Palestine at that time went through Trieste to Egypt, to Alexandria, and then from Cairo they took a train to Haifa, and from up north they reached uh, the center of Palestine. Um, and this is well an impression from the ship on the way over to Palestine. You see a group of Zionists, of Chalutim, and I will only read the one line, and it talks about Zionism, nationalism. The largest part of humanity is anachronistic, and all the Jews, they who are so advanced in Europe, were compelled to prove that they too who, who do the same thing they have so despised and mocked in other nations, that's a totally rejection, rejecting uh, Zionism. In Palestine, his host, his main host is Hugo Bergman who tried to show him uh, Palestine, the Zionist um, working in Palestine and so on, and he's not so convinced. And it's interesting because when you compare his uh, Egyptian diary, it fills with many descriptions about Egypt. But when reaching Palestine, it's very lacon, very short, maybe only five pages. It was still too much for him to deal. And this line really captured this. From the very first moment, I felt torn. And the next slide, please. This is Welfel's most famous work about uh, Judaism and Christianity, and his first attempt to come to some reconciliation. Okay, I will not con convert, but I'm not willing to give up my, uh, I don't know, close uh, affection to Christianity. It's part of me. Okay, so what do we do with that? Also with the impression from the Palestine visit, he sets to write his play, Paul Among the Jews, which set in the time of uh, Kaiser Caligula in the first century AD. Paul returns to Palestine, and it's interesting because uh, through the whole play, everybody speaks to him as Rabbi Shaul. Nobody calls him by his new Christian name, Paul. Shaul, to the Jews, is, is a fellow Jew, okay, they have dispute, but still one of them. The highlight of this uh, play comes to when the confrontation with the most liberal religious figure, Jewish figure of the play, Rabbeinu Gamliel, who says to Paul, okay, you may return Jesus to, to the Jewish people. I accept that, okay, fine, but he was not a messiah. I cannot accept that he was the son of God. And Paul, you can see the quote, says, uh, yeah, he was the messiah, and Gamliel says, he was a man, and this is where the play ends. And he, with this also comes wealth and tragic recognition that these two religion come from the same source, like Paulus. They originated from the same body, but they needed 
to separate. Since I need to finish soon, I will jump now um, to the often conception of the Jews as uh, chosen people and why I see it as some uh, solution to this, whole, uh, to this whole problem. I will jump now to the whole period in America. In 1940, Four, he published uh, an English translation of his aphoristic theological short essay, which he wrote in America. And this is really like a sum of his all uh, theological conception of the interdependency connection between Christianity and Judaism. Therefore, he did not believe Judaism should convert. He always said, what would be Israel without the church? And what would be the church without uh, Israel? And um, I just want to quote what he says. In a chapter called On Christus and Israel, Wilson says, Israel is more than a nation. It is an historical and biological order, an order into which, according to the decree of God, one enters by birth, never to be released until the last day. This is also the reason why he as a Jew cannot convert. This is a biological order. Israel is chosen, not only in the sense of chosen people. Israel as a people and a separate entity sacrifices itself for the divine being. He means here Jesus, and this is interesting. In Welfel view, Israel must, really must, reject the Messiah because it all needs to wait until the last day of uh, judgment until uh, everything is sorted out. And I will still another two minutes because I want to close it in some way to show how this uh, really was an up, uh, a solution for Welfen. In America, already the first time he visited there, in the mid-1930s, Welfen spoke in an event in an audience in front of American Jews. The same Welfen who always say, I feel pressured by the Zionists, by the Oslo Union, by the Jewish collectiveness. And this is what he tells to them, and I think this is the main point. And I finish with this quotation. Even for a minute, I did not feel as a foreigner in America contrary to all the other places, of course. But among you, again, this is a Jewish audience, I feel at home. I do not belong to those Jews who needed a Columbus, namely Hitler, to discover their Judaism. On the other hand, I do not belong to those Jews who grew up in a true Jewish surrounding, so that they never had any difficulties being Jewish. I needed to discover Judaism on my own way, very awkwardly, very unconsciously, very early. Since then, it is already implemented into my soul through suffering and aw awareness. And I believe, the last line, and I believe that I cannot be thrown out of this Judaism, not by Christians and even not by Jews. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anat. Um, I'm moving on to the second speaker, Mark Weizmann. Mark Weizmann is the director of the Government Affairs and of the Task Force Against Aid and Terrorism for the Simon Wiesenthal Center and serves as its chief representative to the United Nations in New York. Mark Weizmann is also a member of the official U.S. delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Authority, where he chairs the Committee on Antisemitism and Holocaust Denial. He co-edited Generic Hatred, Essays in Memory of Simone Wiesenthal, which won the National Jewish Book Award in 2007. His essay, Jew and Judaism in the Political Theology of Radical Catholic Tradition Traditionalist, will be published this winter by the Vidal Sassoon Center for the Study of Antisemitism. Mark Weizmann will talk about Catholic fundamentalist and the Jewish question. Please, Mark. Uh, 
Thank you. I also would like to begin by acknowledging the uh, debt that we all owe to uh, Robert Wistrich. Um, and I was trying to think of something that hadn't been said before, and I realized that uh, I should actually say, among other things, that it's been an, very much of an honor to be published by Robert, and that let me realize that the debt that I owe, and I think that a lot of us owe to him as a very close reader of our own works and as an editor as well, is something that is very much has not been acknowledged yet, and I would like to uh, acknowledge that publicly. Um, I also want to say I have a lot of slides that we'll go through somewhat quickly, some will skip. Um, it just I just sort of got carried away with doing this. So I apologize in advance for that. Um, but you can listen and get the same amount of knowledge as, uh, as you see in the pictures. Um, in the introduction to what is arguably his magnum opus, A Lethal Obsession, Anti-Semitism from Antiquity of the Global Jihad, Robert Wistrich wrote that in the post-1948 uh, period, and I quote, Israel itself would gradually emerge as the new Jewish question. And this is something, the issue of the Jewish question he had also de dealt with in his, early, in his later book um, on a lethal ambivalence, ambivalence to betrayal, the left, the Jews, and Israel, where he dealt with Bruno Bauer's seminal essay on the same, very same question. And there he concluded that um, as he quoted again, a quote from that book, that emancipation must be denied, according to Bauer, to the Jews unless they abandon their Jewishness. Thus, is firmly, firmly anchoring the question, the issue of the Jewish question, in issues of both uh, political and social identity of Jews, as well as the inherent anti Semitism involved in the question itself. We're here today, um, coincidentally, given the topic that I'm speaking about during the Pope's visit to Israel, the first visit to Israel, and it is very noteworthy above and beyond the traffic jams that have been caused as a result. Um, and I think that one of the things that we have seen is the difficulty sometimes in Jewish-Catholic relations, as I'm sure you've all seen the propaganda photos that came out yesterday, and how easily a well-meaning visit can slip into um, a very difficult and raise difficult and, and, uh, and dramatic questions of the relationship between Jews and, and Catholics in particular. But I think there's no question of the inherent goodwill in Pope Francis, um, and this is not a novelty. As he expressed to a delegation of ours by institution, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, that met with him earlier this year, that he affirmed the church condemns every form of anti-Semitism. And we know that this is something that he has done for years as he began even originating in Buenos Aires um, a couple of years ago a commemoration for the commemoration of the Kristallnacht um, pogrom in 1938. This past year, and if we can go to the slides, can we go to PowerPoint over there? Is this? Okay. Yeah, it's not that. No, that's not that one. You so no, it was on the bottom of there. Before. Yeah, the computer crashed. I need it again. Well, maybe I'll just keep talking. <laughs> no, give it to him and they will do it. See, this is one of the reasons why we could have talked about the internet and anti Semitism, except the computer would probably crash as we did. <laughs> Which has happened to me in the past. Um, so it goes on radical Catholics and Sixa. Anyway, there was a major disruption during this commemoration as a group of young radical Catholics disrupted the ceremony in the uh, cathedral in Buenos Aires. And um, if we go all the way down, keep going much more over there. It starts with an R, so it's all the way down. Wait, 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 go back, back, back a little bit. Radical Catholic. Okay, and then just large. Okay, and now let's go to the, quickly the next one. And if we can just enlarge it. And you can see this was a screenshot taken um, from a radical site, and it shows a little bit of the disturbance of how even this uh, ceremony was disturbed. And it turned out that the people who disturbed it belonged to a group called the Society of St. Pius X, which is the center, the locus of radical Catholic traditionalists. To explain what I mean by that, very shorthand, is that those are the ones who reject the reforms that came out of Vatican II. And I am not going to speak about the inner Catholic reforms or anything like that, 
but I'm going to focus on two areas precisely. One is the area of, of religious freedom in general. The other is Jews, or more precisely, um, Israel and Zionism in this case. Uh, I've worked on this topic for a number of years and gave an early presentation at Alton Rosenfeld's conference in Indiana a few months ago where I talked more about um, the religious aspect of it based on Yulzi Zak's teachings of contempt and, and their approach to that. I want to take it a little bit of a different direction here. Um, I also want to reintroduce the concept of political theology, which is a concept that the late Uriel Tal, for example, brought up and did a great deal about. Um, and I think we've somewhat maybe lost a little bit of it, but I think it applies both in this case and in many other cases as well. But here I'm going to focus on, as I mentioned, the political aspect of it. So if we go to the next one, um, I'm going to skip this. That, that's too much time. Um, and again, just the recent ADL survey that you've all seen and heard about pointed out that um, Christians in Eastern Orthodox and Catholic countries are more likely to harbor anti-Semitic views than in Protestant countries. And they're not sure why. And they're not sure how that works out or anything. But again, it is very much uh, interesting background to what we're going to talk about in the next one. OK, so the group Society of St. Pius X, this is the major radical Catholic group. And for a number of years during Pope Benedict's um, rule, uh, papacy, they were actually in active negotiations. Benedict made it one of the hallmarks of his uh, papacy to try to bring them back into the church because they were literally in schism, meaning they had been pushed out of the church, and we'll explain why in a minute. But these are cartoons, two cartoons from a traditional site that basically show uh, that the, the society dictating to the church, the established church in Rome, the terms of reconciliation. That was their perspective, that they were the ones who were going to bring the church to their side, not that they had to give in at all to the church. And we'll continue. And you've probably heard of them most famously because of Bishop Richard Williamson, who was the Holocaust-denying bishop that um, became the center of a great deal of attention a few years ago. as just as Benedict was about to lift the excommunication of, of this group, Williamson gave an interview on Swedish TV, which he aired, in which he effectively denied that the Holocaust had ever taken place. And he claimed that, uh, uh, you know, just basically a flat out ho outright Holocaust denial, which he was later convicted in Germany of being a Holocaust denier. So there was a firestorm of criticism and protest. The head of the group, the Archbishop Bishop Fillet, is a Swiss. Um, born uh, Catholic prelate, disassociate, tried to disassociate himself from Williamson's specific views while keeping him in. Later on, making a long story short, Williamson actually was expelled from the group, not because of anything he said in terms of this, but because of his disobedience to the order in general. Now, what happened, we can keep going to this, is these are some of the things that Williamson spoke about. Um, he endorsed the protocols of the elders of Zion. You see the specific Holocaust denial there. Um, Williamson said, and I want to find a quote here just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about in terms of the political stuff. Fillet, when he announced the, his uh, sort of disciplining of Williamson initially, said that w Williamson could not speak about things that he had no authority to, only religious topics. He was not an historian. And it made it seem as if they had never heard of any of these things before. Yet Williamson's anti-Semitism was not new, nor was it very well hidden. Um, in a letter that was posted on the, on the website of the SSPX from 1991, Williamson wrote, this is about the first Gulf War. The war, he wrote, was, uh, quoting here, a creation of the many friends of Israel in the USA whooping for the United States to break the Arab strongman until the Jews recover their true messianic vocation by accepting the church. It may be accepted to continue fanatically agitating in accordance with their false messianic vocation of Jewish world domination. So it may fear that they continue to play their major part in the agitation of the East and the corruption of the West. So here you see the mixture of politics and theology that is going to be a hallmark of what we're going to be talking about, or what we are talking about. And here, by the way, I couldn't resist this photo of David Irving, the notorious Holocaust denier, and Williamson together at an event in London. OK, we can keep going. That was just. Now, the group itself was started by a Swissman uh, born, uh, French born, I'm sorry, a uh, prelate named uh, Marcel Lefevre, who was actually broke over Vatican II with the church. That was the key thing for him. And it turned out that Vatican II was, this, was the red line, basically, for the readmittance into the church. That was the one thing that um, Benedict and, and the people he had negotiating refused to give up on. 
they, they were willing to compromise on issues of the Latin Mass and doctrinal issues like that, but they said specifically that Vatican II, including the famous Nostra Aetate, very specifically Nostra Aetate, which was a document that reformulated the relationship between Jews and Catholics in 1965, was a line that they would not surrender. They would not give in to them on that line. And this was one of the things that Lefevre was really um, very adamant about. He had a very uh, somewhat nasty history about this himself. Um, we could probably go to the next one. Well, no, let's go back to Lefevre for a second. In 1985, he wrote a letter to John Paul in which he was quoted and spoke approvingly of both the World War II area Vichy regime in France and the far-right National Front, and he identified the contemporary enemies of the faith as Jews, communists, and Freemasons. He also criticized, all, this is a quote, all the reforms carried out over 20 years within the church to please heretics, schismatics, false religions, and declared enemies of the church, and he bitterly criticized the Pope's 1986 visit to the uh, synagogue in Rome. And as a matter of fact, a major Nazi war criminal from France, Paul Touvier, found refuge in a SSPX uh, convent in a uh, monastery in Nice and was arrested from there. Um, so it came not just verbal, but it took action as well. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. Let's, let's skip ahead. This is just uh, Williamson again. This is the visit. We can keep going, the Pope's visit. Now, this is a um, Irish priest named Father Dennis Fahey. Um, and I gave a version of this talk in Ireland and was told that it's not Fahey as you grew up in New York pronouncing, but it's Fahey. So if there are Irish men here or women. Fahey is very interesting because he's a key figure in really in bridging and, and is the key theological figure for the SSPX and the radical traditionalists. If you look at their writings, he is the one whose work is most cited, who is most dominant in it. He was a classmate of Lefebvre in, uh, in, in uh, school in Rome. Um, they were both uh, influenced by the same people. They came from the same school, had the same thought process. And he has a whole well-developed theology of anti-Semitism, a very basic, very uh, blunt anti-Semitism. Um, he was influenced very much by the French anti-Dreyfusards, the French right, ultra-right wing um, Catholic movement. and. He carried it forward and later actually became a bridge of bringing it to the United States. So we can keep going. I'm going to go into here. Here he talks about religious liberty. And the contrast, the devil wants the state to put all religions on the same level. In other words, the idea of religious liberty itself is a satanic idea. Because the only true religion, only the church itself, has the right to be free. And they can grant these rights as they wish to other religions. So the concept of religious liberty and freedom and religious equality does not exist at all for this, and they're willing to uh, discuss it in political sense. And Williamson shares that equally. And a quote from Williamson, however, where Catholics are in a sufficient majority, the state may physically prevent the public practice of false religion while tolerating their practice in private. Um, and so you get the idea from it. I mean, we have lots more that I could go with that, but enough to get the idea across. So we can keep going. And in 1997, in publication, this was on the SSPX website and then was pulled off after it became uh, known publicly, it became very controversial. There was a series of essays and articles that talked about how the Jews tried to, uh, uh, we, we can keep going on this one. There's another one over here. That, that the Jews tried to, are inimical to all nations in general and special matter to Christian nations. The status of the Jewish people is to be a theological enemy and they, so they must be opposed at all times by all Christians or all good Catholics anywhere. And if we go to the next one, and the Jewish people persecute Christians, they conspire against the Christian state, and they are known to kill Christians. This was on as of about three years, four years ago when I pulled it off. It was later expunged from the website, but you could still find place, traces of it in different places. So Fahey was very important, and he became a bridge to many ways. And again, I'm, just, I'm not going through all the quotes. How much time do we have? You have uh, 10 minutes. Perfect. OK. 10 minutes. Perfect. Um, so Fahey became a bridge because his work was adopted by a famous American Catholic radio priest named Charles Coughlin. Coughlin was the most popular radio preacher in the United States in the pre-World War II era, reaching literally millions and millions of homes in the US, was a major political influence and factor, um, influencing or attempting to influence elections um, in the White House with Roosevelt and so on. And he adopted Fahey's work. As a matter of fact, he, one of Fahey's small works called The Rulers of Russia was the only book published by uh, Coughlin that he did not write himself. And in that book, 
Fai, among other things, lists names of about 86 different people in the U.S. government and so on who he felt were agents of communism and, and Jewish agents meaning to undermine because communism, according to this, of course, was a Jewish tool along with Freemasonry to undermine the state. Um, so Coughlin brought it to the United States, brought faith to the United States, and through that became very heavily influencing on the uh, uh, American Catholic scene. And Fay also had contact with some of the, and this is the direction I'm not going to go, I'm just going to mention, with some of the English Catholic writers, uh, Belloc and, and Chesterton and that group. There were some points of contact between them as well and a shared anti-Semitism in many ways. So we can keep going. And that's the rulers of Russia, um, which I was able to purchase the original copy on the internet. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, we can keep going. Uh, you know, and these are some of the American far-right people who were influenced by Coughlin and perhaps Fay as well, Willis Cardo and, they, and uh, someone else. Uh, Cardo is probably the most important figure in bankrolling the American far-right movement in the last 50 years, including the Holocaust-denying Institute of Historical Review, David Duke, and so on, all were bankrolled at one time or another by Cardo. Okay, can keep going. Um, I'm going to skip this one. This is the journal of the Historical Review, which is the basic house, or used to be, they don't print it anymore, the house organ of the Holocaust denial in the United States, the Holocaust denying Institute of Historical Review. I put it in there because this issue actually has, I don't even know if you can see it, but it says the Holocaust issue, three Christian views, mm -hmm. and there are three people listed there. Two are Catholic, one are, um, one is a Protestant. One of the Catholics was directly involved with the SSPX. Um, I found evidence of it in an archive a few months ago. Um, the second one, though, is one I want to concentrate on, a man named Joseph Sobrand. Sobrand is important for a few minutes because Sobrand brings it out of the extreme corners into the mainstream. Sobrand began his career writing for the National Review, which was the major intellectual journal of American conser political conservatism until he was actually fired by William Buckley for his anti-Semitism. And Buckley, I should point out, by the way, William Buckley is an example of a traditional Catholic who is not an anti-Semite. Buckley believed in the Latin mass, wanted to restore all the traditional virtues of Catholicism, but rejected totally the anti-Semitism of the radicals that I'm talking about. So it's not a movement that's endemic as a whole, but it's part of or a radicalized version of some of this movement. So Sobran um, wrote things, for example, where he talked uh, very much about um, and actually, I don't have time to go into Sobrand's quotes, but I'll just say that he was fired by Buckley because of that. Um, but if we go past, let's keep going one or two more. That's Sobrand, and that's one of his quotes. An anti-Semite used to mean a man who hated Jews. Now it means a man who is hated by Jews. Um, and the next is Pat Buchanan. If Sobrand is not a name that many people know, everybody has heard of Pat Buchanan because, among other things, he was in about four Republican White Houses as a high-level staffer. He's an MSNBC and you know, Fox News pundit. He's all over the place. Um, I don't have to tell you, or maybe I would tell you, look at the quote. Who would benefit from the endless wars in a region that holds nothing vital to America save oil? Who would benefit from, from war of civilization with Islam? Who other than the neoconservatives and Ariel Sharon? This is very reminiscent of what Williamson wrote in 1991 about the first Gulf War. There's very eerie parallels there. And we know because we also have, and I'm not going to give you the exact quote, Buchanan writing sympathetically about the SSPX, discussing and even saying that the concept of religious liberty is a false concept because there's only one true church. And if there's only one true church, you can't apply religious liberty. Buchanan, there's no question about Buchanan's sympathies of religiously in terms of this, of being a political, a, uh, a very traditional ca uh, Catholic, and extending that, embracing the anti-Semitism and the lack of, uh, of, of political freedom that goes along with the radical Catholics. Um, let's keep going. Uh, All right, now this is where the, the group that I want to spend the last couple of minutes that I have on, because this is actually very interesting. I thought it was very interesting. Um, this is a group of <coughs> radical Catholic traditionalists that were based in Boston. It was a man named Leonard Feeney. Feeney also had major intellectual gifts. He was a graduate of Harvard and Oxford, was literary editor of the Jesuit magazine America, which is one of the most prestigious Catholic journals in the 1930s. But he became very much of a traditionalist. Um, and he had a major case in the 1940s where he was literally silenced by his archbishop in Boston and later uh, received notice of excommunication, which he did not accept. And the issue was because Feeney would be decided that the church doctrine of extra ecclesiasm mula, uh, nulla salus, meaning outside the church there is no salvation, had to be taken in a very literal doctrinaire sense. 
um, and he was not open to any flexibility of it as the church was redefining itself, particularly in a post-Holocaust, post-World War II world, Feeney wanted no part of that. And he rejected it, ended up being uh, thrown out. Then he later went to preach every Sunday at Boston Commons, which is sort of like you know the biggest park in Boston, the Central Park or, or whatever equivalent in Boston. And he would preach to people for decades there. The young Robert Kennedy actually got into an argument with him once over this and, and, and was just totally disgusted by what he heard Feeney, the virulent anti-Semitism that Feeney expressed. So I'm just going to give you a couple of ideas from Feeney's own um, writings. This is a quote from his self-published magazine. Essential to our understanding of our chaotic times is the knowledge that the Jewish race constitutes a united anti-Christian bloc within Christian society. It is working for the overflow of that society by every means at its disposal. And in Israel, about Israel and Zionism, he wrote, the attitude that had prevailed here in the United States, ever since the Jews revealed their intention of snatching up the Holy Land as their dominion. Um, and he just kept going on and on with that. Um, the last one, the story of the crucifixion comes to us with new and stark clarity this Lenten season and the knowledge that the immediate path of Israeli expansion takes in all the sacred shines, shrines of our Lord's passion and death, the holy places of the first Good Friday. So that's Feeney, and again, there's a lot more that could be said about him. But one of the disciples, the Feeney was teaching at Boston College at the time, and there were four people, three others, who joined with him when they were expelled. And one of them, let's go to the next one, um, is a man named Fakri Malouf. And this is fascinating. Malouf was actually Lebanese born, a, um, a Maronite born, who was one of the founding members, one of the original members of the Syrian so, uh, uh, Social Nationalist Party. Um, and you can see the banner of the Social Nationalist Party from there, um, which as someone pointed out this morning, and, and, and scholars have demonstrated it, bears a remarkable similarity to the swastika. And Stanley Payne, the historian of fascism, literally describes as one of the three Arab parties most directly influenced by European fascism. Malouf was actively involved, was on their Supreme Council, was, ran their cultural seminars, was the chairman of the Supreme Council in the 30s and 40s. Um, late 30s and early 40s, uh, did the first translation to English of their uh, a program and principles. You can find it still on Facebook, and they have a website now on there, the third largest party in Syria. Malouf got religion, as it is said, in 1944-45, and became a disciple of Fini. And he later moved into the, we can shift next, and moved in and became um, a, a academic teaching in Fini's place, uh, basically succeeded him as the intellectual leader, the mentor of this group, small group, after they, left, after they left Boston, they moved up to New Hampshire, where they established themselves in a little community up there. It is impossible to get access to their material. I have a Catholic friend up there who tried to get some of it for me, and it's closed to all outsiders. Um, but they have disciples. The man there is a, some, is a young man in the 19, uh, his 30s who succeeded Malouf, who died a couple of years ago in his 90s. Um, and he comes from New Orleans in general. And he wrote, just to give you an idea of what he is saying, um, is, uh, actually, let me go back for one second. The SSNP website, to give you an idea of what they're saying, is they wrote, the Messiah brought, there's a quote, a message of tolerance, forgiveness, benevolence. Neither he was strong and courageous, but he expelled them from the house of his father, spoke to them, children of snakes, how can you speak of good deeds while you are evil? Which is almost directly a quote from Matthew. Um, and then he continues, uh, they have not changed their way since. The Jews who tortured and crucified him, not only in the killing of prophets, but in killing the people of the land in which the Messiah was sent, he and his likes. And today they continue the same habits in Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, and Levant. Now, one of the things that the party tried to do in some of its earliest writings tried to do was to establish a Christian Muslim alliance against Jews and against Zionists. Um, and you can see that train continuing. They have letters to the Pope, uh, to Benedict in their open letters. I'm sure they have some comments about the, uh, this visit in it. But you can see the line coming through and continuing down to this day. Um, Malouf did not write a great deal, but his successor, for example, posted an obituary of Malouf on one of the most radical anti-Semitic -Cath anti Catholic websites um, that's around today. And in response to a critical letter, he wrote a language that clearly echoes Fahi, quote, if anti-Semitism means opposing the Jews on religious matters, opposing the Zionist state in Palestine as St. Pius X did, or opposing the Jewish tendency to undermine public mo uh, morals, 
widely acknowledged by Catholic writers before the present age of PC, that we could rightly be considered such. But if anti-Semitism means unconditionally hating people for genetic and religious purposes, then we are not so. A Catholic who seeks the conversion of all men to the true church, all men including Jews, we actually love them. So they draw a distinction between racial anti-Semitism and between the religious need to dominate and put Jews in their place. All I'm going to say in conclusion is that we just saw this morning, we're seeing the election results from the European Parliament with a surge of extreme far-right parties. Some of them, for example, Bruno Gollnisch in, in France, are very heavily identified with the traditional swing of Catholicism as well. This is an underpinning that we sort of did not think um, would resurge and reappear in a political sense today, but has made its presence felt both in the United States and Europe now. And I think we need to keep an eye on it and be prepared because we've, one thing we have learned over the past few decades is the power of religion as a motivating force, particularly in fanaticism and extremism. And here we have a clear example of something that has been submerged but has not given up hope of trying to take both the Catholic Church and the political world in its wake and to have a major influence and strength upon it. And to conclude, I'm just going to say that in this sense, as with many things else, we need the example uh, that was set by Professor Wistrich, who a number of years ago actually resigned from a joint Jewish Catholic commission uh, to investigate the acts of uh, the Pope during the war because of the lack of access to the archives. And it's that kind of scholarly integrity and personal integrity that I think we all could use as a guide light in the way future. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We are moving on to our third speaker, so we will have time for a discussion. Uh, Giovanni Matteo Quer studied law and holds a PhD in international studies from the University of Otrento. He specializes in human rights and protection of minorities, focusing on human rights law, human rights policies, and political ideas inspiring human rights agents. He's currently visiting at the, F the European Forum at the Hebrew University, researching uh, uh, European human rights external policy in the Mediterranean. He will talk today, the Jews, Israel, a new replacement theology. Please, Matteo. Okay, Giovanni. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Professor Wistrich, for the invitation. Um, I was given today the opportunity to speak about a fascinating subject which I came across in my research on human rights agents in the Middle East. And I realized that the intellectual background, the ideological background that they are operating in, is rooted in a new form of replacement theology, which draws from liberationist theologies developed in the 70s and 80s, and from anti-Judic tenets developed in the social Catholic movement in the 18th and 19th century. So I will briefly analyze what replacement theology is, this in an ideological background, and then focus on Palestinian replacement theology. So, um, can you, yeah. So, replacement theology has been the official doctrine of the Catholic Church for centuries, whereby the covenant between God and the Jewish people has been suppressed by the advent of Jesus. Okay, and. From this, we can see that the, 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 the Torah has been suppressed by the New Testament, and the whole idea of Israel as the Jewish people has been voided of its national meaning, whereby Israel signifies a sort of, it uh, has become a sort of abstract idea of a spiritual community of, of believers. And from this replacement theology, many of the traditional anti judaic tenets have developed, such as Jewish perfidy on the account of Dayside and uh, eye for an eye, Jewish particularism and supremacism on the account of the idea of the chosen people, and the general idea that Judaism is somehow um, obsolete, sterile, and, and legalistic. On this background, the social Catholic movement 
has developed in the 18th, 19th and 20th century. It's a time when the church opened up to new ideas such as class struggle and economic justice, the Rerum Novarum encyclical letter and the Quadrigesimo Anno encyclical letter. And somehow, social Catholics have combined the Christian salvific message with the socialist revolutionary message, promoting an idea of Jews as exploiters of the Christian working masses and of dominators of the Christian world. And we can see that the uh, leading, the key figures of this ideology were bishops, priests, and above all, um, those who wrote in the Catholic priests. It's just after the Holocaust that this theology, the replacement theology, has been revised. So, um, above all, during the Second Vatican Council, the um, whole idea of replacement theology has been sort of mitigated. Jewish-Christian dialogue has been promoted, and Jewish roots of Christianity have been reconceded. However, this is also the time during which the church opened to new ideas such as international peace and international order, and the role of the church, the missionary role of the Catholic Church in the, in the international order. And it's in this background that liberation theologies, so the second <laughs> pillar of the a new replacement theology, have developed. They have first developed in Southern America in the 70s, the leading figure here is Gustavo Gutierrez. He's a Peruvian priest. And he actually accepted the, the expression liberation theology as a message directed first and foremost to the working masses, okay, to the oppressed. And it has further developed in Brazil, in all, in all Southern America, as a theology uh, directed to the uh, working masses. Secondly, it has developed in Northern America through the black liberation movement. And uh, we arrive in South Africa with the culmination of liberation theology in 1989 when the Cairo South Africa document was adopted. It's a theological, political document denouncing the apartheid regime and denouncing the uh, reformed, uh, the Dutch reformed church which backed the uh, apartheid regime. Let me briefly underline what the tenets of liberation theology are. They combine neo-Marxist theories and Christian theology. So according to neo-Marxist theories, power is inherently oppressive. Okay? Anything that is power or authority is oppressive. Be it an authoritarian regime, an economic system, or a form of cultural oppression. Whereas Liberation theologies developed the idea that Jesus is somehow the leader of the oppressed. Okay? And they, above all, developed the idea that God prefers the oppressed, the preferential love for the oppressed. This is very important in terms of Palestinian, Palestinian theology. And the second important tenet is the combination of justice and martyrdom. The revolutionary message of Marx's theories is re-elaborated in Christian terms as a call on Christians to resist oppression and then to struggle against oppression and to rebel. So this is, we can see the recurrent patterns of the, the, the old social Catholic movement and liberation theologies, which is the combination of the salvific message and the re revolutionary message of um, uh, Christianity and uh, socialism and Marxism, respectively, and the actors, bishops, priests, activists, and above all, the role of the church, which is quite unassertive, if not supportive. OK, so this is the background. And in this background, the Palestinian theology is rooted, the new Palestinian the new replacement theology promoted by Palestinian theologians. By the way, all the pictures that you see are uh, taken from um, uh, Christian sites uh, back in the Palestinian narrative or ad adopting the Palestinian narrative. So I claim that 
the Palestinian theology promoted by Palestinian theologians, priests, bishops, is liberationist in the sense that it's directed to the oppressed Palestinian people against the Zionist oppressor, and in this sense, it's anti-Zionist. It's contextual because it's, it's not a universal theology. It's directed only to the Palestinians. It's contextualized in the Arab-Israeli conflict. And in this sense, it's also nationalistic because it's tailored on Palestinian narrative and needs. And third, of, and third, it's a replacement theology because it replaces Jewish ideas, Jewish meanings with Christian and Palestinian meanings. So there's a double replacement. First of all, Jewish ideas are replaced with Christian ideas as the traditional replacement theology. And secondly, it's replaced with Palestinian um, narrative. And we will see uh, how. How has it developed? The the, the, the starting point is 1989 with the publication of the book Justice and Only Justice by Naim Atik. He's an Episcopalian um, Arab Israeli. Um, and in this book, there are the first ideas of Palestinian theology. It has further developed in the 90s and 20s, above all in the Catholic priests by um, Catholic um, Palestinian actors. And it culminates in 2009 with the adoption of the Kairos Palestine document. Now, the Kairos Palestine document is modeled on the Kairos South Africa, and it's not by chance that they use the word Kairos. Kairos in Greek means time in a qualitative sense, and it's the word that's used in the um, New Testament for time, meaning um, turning point in history, momentum. And it's a theological and political document directed against Israel, against Zionism, Zionism, which sets forth the basic tenets of the Palestinian replacement theology, endorsing as well the BDS, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction uh, Movement. So what are, I, I, I chose three of the main um, of the main concepts that um, Palestinian theology elaborates on. The first one is justice. Okay? Justice is interpreted as the plight for liberation of the oppressed. In the Palestinian, in the contextualized Palestinian theology, oppression is the occupation defined as a sin, as the ultimate sin. The Zionist occupation is the ultimate sin, and this is very important in terms of promotion of anti-Judaism, as, as we will see. Secondly, the promised land. There is a direct accusation against the Jews who interpret the idea of promised land in a nationalistic way, while the promised land is voided of its Jewish meaning and it's resignified in terms of a general idea of a place of peace and, and justice. Simultaneously, the Palestinian theological narrative elaborates the uh, concept of indigenous Christian, whereby the legitimate heirs of the promised land, of this land, should be the Palestinian Christians because they are here since the time of Jesus, while Jews came from all over the world. Third, the chosen people. Again, we have an accusation of a supremacist interpretation of the Bible on the idea of chosen people and a replacement by the Palestinians. Why? Because according to the liberationist theology uh, tenet of preferential law for the oppressed, God prefers the oppressed, God has chosen the oppressed, and therefore the chosen people in this context um, is the Palestinian people. Kairos Palestine goes further, endorsing the BDS movement um, and a direct delegitimization of Israel. First of all, the concept of justice is not only defined in terms of oppression and oppressed, but it's, there's a direct call for resistance. It's a duty of the Christian to resist oppression, to resist the sinner, and be witness of justice. Here we have a re-elaboration of the concept of martyrdom, which is somehow, I would say, Islamized. Um, they go so far to justify um, even suicide bombers, not in the Kairos Palestine, but in another document written by Naim Atik. 
And secondly, it's, um, the, second, uh, the second concept is love. What is Christian love? It comes from the commandment, um, and you will love thy enemy. And therefore, officially, the Kairos Palestine document refuses violence and endorses nonviolence. And therefore, an act of love and justice is the BDS movement, the boycott and divestment and boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, because the BDS is a form of nonviolent struggle against oppression and against the ultimate sin. Now, how 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 does the replacement work? We have a constant um, have constant references to um, the Bible, but the biblical narrative is substituted by the Palestinian narrative. I give here a few examples. One is the Babylonian exile. Okay? The Babylonian exile is reinterpreted in Palestinian terms. Who is in exile? The Palestinians. And they come and they go so far to um, define the Psalm number 42 as the cry of the Palestinian refugee. I will give another example here, there are four, but just the second one, which is very important, is the Exodus. The reference to the Exodus is Palestinized. So the enslaved Hebrews become the Palestinian under occupation, while the oppressive authority, authority the Pharaoh, becomes, the, uh, becomes Israel and the Zionist movement. Now, why do I claim that there are anti-Judaic roots? Because when they speak, when they say, when they claim that occupation is a sin, they say that Zionists are victim of a particular interpretation of the Bible that stems from the idea of a Torahic God who is a God of wrath, a God of violence, and militaristic interpretation a militaristic Jewish interpretation of the Bible. And this is a pure anti-Judaic um, uh, stance. While they say the God of the New Testament is a God of love, is a God of peace. Again, when they, accu when they accuse Jews of being the chosen people, they say that this is a particularistic and nationalistic interpretation, while the um, God of the New Testament has a universalist and uh, uh, inclusive uh, message. Now, replacement is not only of the biblical narrative, and it's not only of um, replacement in terms of Christian and Palestinian narrative, but it's also a replacement of liturgy. Palestinian theologians have developed an entire liturgy, an entire Palestinian liturgy. And I'll, there are several examples. I think that the most significant is the Way of the Cross. The Way of the Cross is one of the most important uh, moments in uh, Christian uh, um, liturgy that's celebrated uh, before Esther. And it recalls the path that Jesus has walked from his condemnation to his crucifixion with 14 steps, which are called uh, stations. And each one of of these steps has a specific symbolic and theological meaning. So first there's the condemnation of Jesus, then Jesus carries the cross, uh, Jesus falls three times, etc., etc., until the crucifixion, death, and resurrection. Now, there's a new way of the cross, which is called Palestinian way of the cross, whereby the condemnation of Jesus is reinterpreted as the Nakba. And this is significant. This is very, very significant. Why? Because Jesus has been condemned, according to the New Testament, by the Romans and by the Jewish religious authorities. And therefore, the Nakba, which is the condemnation of the Palestinian people, again, we have the idea that the Palestinian people has been condemned by Israel, so the Jews, and by the international community. Here we have a resignification of the day side um, um, account. Jesus falls three times. We have the occupation, the checkpoints, and house demolitions. So we see that Jesus becomes the Palestinian people. And it's not by chance that sometimes Abu Mazen refers to Jesus as the first, the first uh, a Palestinian. The nailing of Jesus on the cross is the blockade on Gaza, and the death of Jesus becomes the so-called apartheid wall. And this liturgy, I, I, I should stress, it's not just a booklet which is published and circulates on the net. There are entire weeks dedicated to praying and singing for the Palestinian sufferance. 
and this Palestinian way of the cross happens here and it happens uh, all around the world. I had no idea actually of the extent to which it was spread until some days ago. Um, I was working on this speech and I received an email by a man living in a remote town in northeastern Italy. Um, he defined himself as a believer, very active in his church, and he inquired me about the um, initiatives that his priest promoted in, uh, in his community, and they included the Palestinian way of the cross. So I realized that it's a widespread uh, liturgy. Um, concluding, I would like to stress on the actors, the activism, and on the consequences of this replacement theology. We have theologians, we have churchmen. Again, the role of bishops and priests is fundamental. I have listed here some, some of them. Um, Naim Atik, who is Episcopalian, Michel Sabah, who is a former um, Latin patriarch, so Catholic. Theodosius Hanna and Nadion Capucci, who are Greek Orthodox, and by the way, they have, um, both of them have a a travel pass with the Israeli legal system on account of Aden about terrorism. Jerry Said Khoury, another Catholic, Rafik Khoury, vicar of the, of the Latin Patriarchate, um, Catholic Mitri Raheb, uh, he's Protestant. So we have different denominations. It's an interdenominational um, movement. We also have theological centers that promote this Palestinian replacement theology, like Sabil Ecumenic Center, Tantur, Alika, Anadwa, several centers here, and many churches all around the world that have um, that have uh, endorsed the Kairos Palestine movement in Europe, Northern America, Mexico, Brazil, um, South Africa, even Nigeria. Even Nigerian churches have endorsed the Kairos. Um, um, uh, Kairos Palestine movement. As I said, we have recurrent patterns, but it's far, it's, the, the Kairos Palestine movement is a global movement which is much more far reaching. Why? Because it affects also international organizations, international NGOs such as Pax Christi, Pope 23rd, John 23rd associations, and they, many of these associations also have representatives in international bodies such as the UN and UNESCO. So it's a far reaching in new interpretation, theological interpretation of the Israeli. Um, Israeli-Arab-Israeli -Israeli conflict. In, in concluding, I say that the Kairos Global Movement promotes a Palestinian replacement theology which is both anti-Judaic and anti-Zionist. It's anti-Judaic insofar as it promotes traditional anti-Judaic tenets such as Jewish perfidy, Jewish supremacism, etc. And it's anti-Zionist Insofar as it is liberationist, it directs, uh, is directed against the Zionist occupier and sinner, and insofar as it promotes the delegitimization and demonization of Israel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Giovanni Quer. So we have enough time. We have 20 minutes for question. I, I want to stress one thing. I know that I'm a bit uh, short comments and short questions, if possible, so we can have everybody asking. Yes, and you can present yourself. Yes, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm Ben Cohen. I spoke this morning. Uh, Mark, I noticed something on one of your slides. Stand up, uh, please. Sorry. Uh, I noticed that you, the Facebook page of the Williamson Appreciation Society gave an address as the Christian Quarter in Jerusalem. I wondered if you could say something about that, and it might, maybe perhaps it's connected to what uh, uh, Giovanni was talking about as well. Yeah, I, actually, what I will say is that's an old slide. Uh, that's about three, four years old already. I'm not sure if that's still in existence. Uh, Williamson has his own website now because he was expelled from the SSPX. Uh, it's basically, you have to be a member to get you know, uh, really into it. Um, but his support is definitely, he has support in different circles not just on the radical right, but also in, uh, in uh, some, I guess we'd say Arab or you know, whatever circles, um, along with uh, actually some surprising left-wing supporters as well. 
Okay, so uh, Professor Vistig was in the middle of a question to Giovanni Quer and can. Yeah, just to recapitulate, uh, the question is whether you think that among the, the Protestant denominations, uh, you have a similar usage <coughs> of uh, the Catholic uh, uh, Catholic version of liberation theology, or are there any nuances? And to Mark uh, Beitzman's very straightforward question about the Pius X fraternity, Pius X was known as the anti-modernist pope. I wonder Denied. if there's anything you could elaborate on regarding Denied. that theology and why they chose Pius X. Is it the anti-modernism? Pius IX was Pius IX. Uh, yes. In regard to Pius X, he is the, the model, the hero for them. And they chose him because of his rejection of modernity and anything that said, uh, Somewhat smacks of modernity is what they consider the beginning of the weakening of the church, and his firm stand, his uh, his bans on, on all sorts of uh, everything from science and anything almost enlightenment related, made him the model that they emulated and chose as their figurehead. So, uh, Was Pius, Pius the tenth, if I, uh, the ninth? Sorry, Pio Nono, el antimodernista, the pope, antimodernist pope. Si, Giovanni, scusa. Um, so about Protestant churches, the make extensive use of liberation theologies, uh, liberationist theologies, and they've actually developed their own liberationist theologies. For example, the Black Liberation Movement in Northern America, North America, in the U.S., uh, was backed by many Black churches. Now, in the Protestant world, you have above all Methodist churches and Presbyterian churches who have endorsed the Kairos Palestine movement and promote this new replacement theology. So um, I tried to I tried to focus on uh, Palestinian actors. And this is an interdenominational movement. So Catholics and all over the Protestant world, as we use um, recently, just <coughs> last week, uh, the Church of uh, the Presbyterian uh, Council of the Council of Presbyterian Churches of Pennsylvania voted on the BDS, for example. So. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Professor Yakira, please. Uh, I have a question to Giovanni. Um, a double question, actually. Um, are there other voices in, my, in the uh, church, the Palestinian church? And what is the connection between them and Israeli Christians? Uh, inside this room. What, what, what kind of voices you hear from there? So many of these theologians uh, define themselves as Palestinians, but many of them are Palestinian Israelis, are Arab Israelis, are citizens of the state of Israel. So the idea of 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 uh, describing of, of saying that they are Palestinians is also a political stance, obviously. So, um, a, a, a countercurrent is just in Israel. You have um, Maronites and the Greek Orthodox um, that are that they try to oppose this new replacement theology and the Palestinian theology. Um, they have organized. Um, they are organized in several associations that are all reunited in a Christian lobby under the leadership of Father Gabriel Nadab, who is a Greek Orthodox. Um, you have also several denominations. You have also some Protestants, mainly in the Galilee, and you have also Catholics. And they actually um, refuse, they reject this idea of a Palestinian theology opposed to the Jewish theology. They accept of being Israelis, and they have another vision of things that go so far also to accept the idea that, of uh, serving in the army, in the Israeli army, right. based on like, theological uh, arguments. And someone like uh, Shufrani from Nazareth? Um, that I don't know. I can't answer. Yes, sir. Uh, very quickly, Mr. Weitzman, I, I wonder if uh, 
the, the sense that the, uh, your emphasis on right-wing Catholicism, uh, I've had a little misleading in the sense I think that the mainstream church was much closer to that point of view, certainly during the 1930s and 40s. Uh, while Corbyn was, was uh, silent in 1942, his followers remained extremely active in major U.S. cities through World War II, which is the period when you see the highest level of anti-Semitic violence in American history. It becomes very safe for Jews to walk the streets, very unsafe for Jews to walk the streets. Uh, the Jewish youth are being beaten, uh, sometimes mutilated and disfigured in attacks by Irish Catholic youth. Uh, Jewish girls are having their tor uh, clothes ripped off in the streets. And uh, this receives a lot of uh, uh, coverage in the Jewish press and in uh, mainstream newspapers like the New York Post and PM. Uh, Coughlin's, uh, really I think his major lieutenant, Edward Lodge Curry, uh, has a regular column in uh, the Brooklyn Diocesan newspaper, the tablet, and there are other no, bishops that know. support uh, these viciously anti-Semitic views, where Jews are described as, as Christ killers and so on. So my question is, uh, 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 I think that the uh, mainstream church is much closer to these right-wing views, certainly in that period. Uh, and I got the impression you were uh, putting forward, and certainly on issues like uh, that the persecution of Catholics in Mexico was worse than what the Jews are going through in Germany. That type of thing is fairly mainstream in the church. And, uh, the, the question. Uh, members of the hierarchy. Yes. Of what is the question? I, I think I understand this question. Okay. Uh, in the full version that I did not have time to give, I actually make reference to some of that. And even going beyond what you said, there was a memo in the FDR archives that they uncovered where FDR wrote a handwritten note to Myron Taylor, his representative to the Vatican, in which he said to Taylor, uh, maybe you should tell the people in Brooklyn and uh, Chicago and Detroit that the anti-Catholic stuff, um, the anti-Jewish stuff reverberates with anti-Catholic, and that gets all the way up to the Vatican. In other words, FDR himself drew attention to that issue. Uh, Patrick Scanlon, the editor of the tablet, um, was virulently anti-Semitic, totally in favor of Coughlin and so on. And uh, Salt and Salt, the governor of Massachusetts and LaGuardia, the mayor of New York, also appointed commissions to investigate the violence against Jews that was put on by the uh, Catholic Front and other groups that spun off from uh, Coughlin. So there's no question there uh, was a period where there was physical violence in the middle of World War II, after the U.S. had entered the war already, um, aimed at Jews in particularly the northeastern cities where there was a strong Irish Catholic presence, uh, Boston, New York, for example. Um, and the, the question, I also want to point out that Gerald L. K. Smith, who was possibly, uh, was a link between um, Huey Long and Coughlin, also embodied, even though he's Protestant, a lot of this anti-Semitism um, and tried to bring it into the mainstream political arena. But that faded very quickly after the war, after the silencing of Coughlin. Um, we're seeing the silencing of Feeney as well. And then the church itself has moved away from that up until recently when negotiations with the SSPX began to admit them in. There were cardinals in the Vatican and so on who were sympathetic to the SSPX. And you're talking about group numbering and sympathizers in the millions around the world today. Um, even if they're technically, some are not in, in excommunication, some are sympathizers who are within the church. So it's very hard to put a pin down with an exact figure. But there is, as I said, uh, points of contact and negotiation with the church that are going ongoing even today. Our last question, please, sir. Just a uh, quick comment. Professor Yakira raised the uh, question of the impact of uh, the Cairo's Palestine document for Israeli and Palestinian Arabs. In the diaspora, it's a huge issue for us, potentially, in so far that if that uh, Palestine the Kairos document gets significant traction, it will begin to cause direct uh, anti Semitism and uh, fissures within the interfaith uh, circles. So there's a lot writing on this issue. So far, the church, Catholic Church, for its own historic reasons, is distanced it from it. But on a number of uh, uh, interfaith meetings they've convened without Jews, they have allowed individuals to present uh, the Kairos Palestine document under the the uh, culterate of, uh, of the Catholic Church, uh, the Vatican's presentation. Last reaction. Do you want to add something to? Yeah, about, about this, you would say that you said that um, interfaith dialogue 
uh, Jews were not present for the interface dialogue meetings. And this is something very typical of the Kairos Palestine um, document and in general of the Kairos Palestine global movement. They are ready to talk and to, to, to talk to Jews uh, just when Jews reflect certain ideas. So just with reformed uh, anti-Zionist uh, Jews. So, for example, we have also uh, Jewish theologians that back this replacement theology, Mark Ellis, for example, or Jewish intellectuals such as Judith Butler, they directly quote and they meet with these Jewish intellectuals. So, the Christian-Jewish dialogue is really reduced to a certain stream of, of Jewish intellectuals. So I thank you very much for your attention and we move to the fourth session. Thank you.